Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. This is supposed to be Mormonism Live. Bill Real, we seem to have an interloper. Look at this guy. How did he get on here? What's going on here? Good What's old John DeLynn. Awesome. So this Good, this pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is John DeLynn. Look at that. Could you introduce Folks. yourself in the audience? <laughs> I'm John DeLynn of Mormon First Podcast and friend of Nemo. Yes, otherwise... Sorry. <laughs> Otherwise known as Dr. Delenn. So here we go. <laughs> I told you we this night so would be tonight. monumental. This is going to be a joy. I'm so sorry. I, I'm, I'm really excited about tonight, and I just talked over you, Bill. I apologize. No, no, no. I talked, I talked over you, but I just said I told everybody tonight would be monumental. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely monumental. Stay up with Mormonism Live and watch the stars come out. So I'm very excited about tonight. This is a joint production. I think it's the first of its kind, at least with us. It's kind of like Elvis live from Hawaii. We've got Mormon Stories, John DeLynn, and this is going to be appearing at Mormon Stories if we don't totally cock it up. But that'll <laughs> be on Friday, I understand. I'm trying to get in my, my British lingo because we have a wonderful bloke from England on the show tonight. Don't bring him on yet. Don't bring him on yet. But this is going to be a fantastic episode because Nemo has been over the past year or so been engaged in an effort to find out what happens if you follow the church's policy about registering dissent with an opposing vote and seeing how that works out. And he's going to tell us all about it tonight, live on Mormonism Live. And Mormon Stories. Oh yeah, those guys too. So, <laughs> John, it's so great to have you here tonight. It's really an honor. Okay, that's the last serious thing I'm going to say. So if we can bring on Nemo, we've got so much material to get through and so many slides that he's presented to describe his adventure of the past year. Here's Nemo, otherwise known as Captain Nemo. Hi, everyone. What time is it there, Nemo? Oh, it's uh, about half one in the morning. You look tired. I feel tired. <laughs> Uh, you're about to see the last 18 months of my life has led me to this point. <laughs> can I, can I yeah. ask you something? What the hell is half one in the morning? Um, half past one a.m. Oh, half past one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, very good. We'll see if we can keep you long enough so you can watch the sunrise. Yeah, that's yeah. That would be a while. <laughs> all right. Well, Nemo, Nemo, we've got all night, baby. So. Tell us your story. Launch off with you, would you, with where it begins? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so this story begins with the fact that I am a member of the church and uh, I'm uncomfortable with some of the things that the general authorities say publicly, which aren't true. Um, and so I decided I wanted to vote a post, uh, as is my, my right to do so. Uh, and then this ensuing story is the story of what happens when you don't let that go and you just keep asking yes you don't allow yourself to be fobbed off by some no. middle level management suck-ups mm -hmm. yeah although to be fair and i do want to get this out i won leadership roulette some of this is down to the fact that my local leaders were willing to go through this process with me they were willing to to see where this went ultimately it went the way that we all think it would but they were willing to to work out me with this and so because of that uh, i have redacted their names in what will follow uh, and i've tried to remove some identifying information so they're not going to get particularly doxxed i mean you could probably work it out but i'm doing my best to kind of respect them because you know 
they they did a good job by me in all this. Very good. But you were like a JRT with a bone on this. Hmm. Whatever that is. Jack Russell Terrier. There we go. Yes. I think they like come from your neck of the woods. Most likely. I think my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. Tell uh, us your story. So, yeah. Can I get the PowerPoint on screen, please? Because I'm not able to add it. There we go. Oh, here right. we go. So this is called Dear Dallin. Um, and it is my letter to Apostle. And the first thing you all need to know is this was uh, not done by Nemo the Mormon. I didn't sign these emails off as Nemo the Mormon. <laughs> um, funnily enough, it was done under my real name because I'm an active member who attends church. Um, so... But I am now sharing it as Nemo the Mormon because this is the platform and this is the, the ability I have now to share this story and hope that it will kind of do some good. So it all starts really with the, uh, the invitation that we all receive at conference to, um, to participate. So we can have this video, Maven. Brothers and sisters, I will now present the general authorities, area 70s, and general officers of the church for your sustaining vote. Please express your vote in the usual way, wherever you may be. If there are those who oppose any of the proposals, we ask that you contact your stake president. Okay. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, we'll see that I did do just that. I... I voted opposed at the next ward conference. Um, that's me stood there voting opposed. And we all think we know what happens when we vote opposed. Uh, and so I sent a letter to my state president and this is a type and shadow of letters to come. Uh, so you so did what, so you did I did what, what I was told. told you to do. Yeah, I did what I was told. And what I did throughout this process was um, I would kind of, I would explain or, or follow up with my leaders um, about what had happened. Basically, I'd sum it up and send it to them uh, and say, right, here's the meeting we had. Here's where we're at. Um, can we move forward? So the interesting thing about my meeting, my first meeting with my state president was that he didn't invalidate the logic of my assertion that they were lying. But he said we couldn't ask those who could answer, i.e. the top church leaders, um, but I was determined to see if someone could answer this question. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff in here about me getting a temple recommend, and that will be an important theme because throughout all of this, I was essentially pushing and saying, I should still be able to go to the temple and not sustain church leaders. Why are they a gatekeeper to me being able to go to the temple? Why uh, do they stand in the way of that? Why essentially do they come between me and the, the pinnacle of Mormon religious worship? And there's some stuff in here about being able to be a good Christ-like person and still be able to, uh, and, and but not be able to go to temple. It's not Nemo, great. <laughs> Nemo, yeah. no, it's not great. But I'm going to put you in a position here where we're going to want to make sure we preserve everything in mm -hmm. audio because some of this will be yeah. going out in simple audio form. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you the ability to either read mm -hmm. or assign one of us okay. to read any given document. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right, so I can read the highlights of this one, really. Um, the, 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 one of the main paragraphs is where I'm talking to the state president. He says, more than once you stated you, I say to him, more than once you stated you do not have an answer for me. I appreciate and respect your honesty. I requested and would like to redouble this request now that I'd be put in touch with someone who does have answers. This is why I've included the area authorities in this email in the hopes that they can help me or pass me on to someone who can. In order for the opposing vote and common consent to be meaningful, it has to be more than a formality. Concerns have to be addressed because my opposition was not made lightly, and I maintain my position despite the personal cost to myself, such as a refusal of a temple recommend. So that's the kind of position I'm coming from. And the I end, I say, I know you and Bishop Blank are sincere in your sentiments that I am welcome in the ward and stake and that my opposition is not a problem. However, practically within the structures of the church, I am still a second class member of the church due to my opposition to leaders. I would therefore like to resolve this. And including members of the area presidency, 
uh, tends to get you on the radar a little bit. Uh, and so an Area 70 got in touch with me, a guy called Alan Phillips. Um, he was asked to speak with me by the Area Presidency. Uh, RFM, do you want to read this document? I would love to. Thank you. Uh, are you okay if I read the whole thing? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Including your name? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dear, by the way, do we pronounce that still go? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Dear brother, still go. So this is from the regional rep? This is from an Area 70, yeah. Area 70 named Alan Phillips. Mm -hmm. Dear brother, still go. And this is uh, related regarding a meeting together Sunday the 12th or 19th of December. Now, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that was last year, 2021? It was. Okay. Dear brother, still go. I serve with Elder, Elder DeFeo and Elder Kopischke. And they shared with me your feelings regarding sustaining the senior leadership of the church. They discussed it with me during the recent visit of President Ballard, Elder Holland, and Elder Cook. Oh, that was back on Halloween of last mm -hmm. year, right? Oh, I remember that. And asked if I would meet with you on this matter. As we near Christmas, my official assignments and travel have come to an end. If it works with your schedule, I could travel out and attend the Oxford Ward on either Sunday the 12th December or Sunday 19th December, we could possibly attend sacrament meeting together and then sit down together afterwards. Would either of those dates work best for you? Please let me know, and I will let Bishop Blank, who's your bishop, correct? Mm -hmm. Please let me know, and I will let Bishop Blank know. Uh, I'll let him know I will attend the ward accordingly. I look forward to meeting you soon with love, Elder Phillips, or parentheses, Alan. And I find it really, like a very it's nice. Yeah. I find it interesting that he has to let the bishop know he's going to be in the ward because, you know, he has to make sure that the deacons know to give him the sacrament first. Like he's got to, <laughs> you know, he's got to forewarn them that he's going to be there. Um, so we set up that meeting. Uh, and again, we had the meeting and I sent a follow up email uh, to that. So this is quite a long one, but I'll read kind of the main points of it. Uh, so, um, I said, hi, Elder Phillips. It was great to meet with you today. Thank you very much for taking the time to meet with me and for coming out of your way. Thank you also for engaging in what is a difficult conversation. I feel I have walked away with a better understanding of why the culture and systems of the church do not progress as quickly as we'd like and found your generational explanation enlightening. With that said, and avoiding the use of the word lie, because he didn't really like that when we were having our conversation, it is still apparent to me that the evidence indicates the brethren have made statements to lead members to believe one thing which they would know are factually in incorrect. They have also denied things that have happened and that they know happened. That's the kindest way I can think of to put it. By the standards set out in gospel principles, they have been dishonest, arose by any other name and all that. Below is my main point from my notes. The evidence clearly shows that church leaders, including Russell M. Nelson, Dan H. Stokes, M. Russell Ballard, and Jeffrey R. Holland, are not always honest. They have repeatedly made false, dishonest, and misleading statements publicly in their capacity as prophets, seers, and revelators. These lies fall into four categories. Lies to cover misdeeds, oaks and conversion therapy. Lies to bolster faith, Nelson in his plain story, Holland talking about the growth of the church. Lies to protect the church, Holland talking about Prop 8 and the John Sweeney interview. And then lies to gain trust. Ballard, just trust us. We've never tried to hide anything from anybody. Why is this permissible for the mouthpiece of God to be dishonest? And if it is not permissible, what is to be done about it? Can we hold senior ch church leaders accountable? Are they accountable for their actions? If so, to whom? If not, why not? Is it the second anointing? God is the one that gave these rules regarding the need to be honest. He also gave us common consent, the way by which we can oppose the leaders. It would seem they aren't even accountable to God as they have faced no consequence of common consent, nor have they acknowledged or apologized for their dishonesty as of yet. Then there's a bit more about our conversation at the end. And I'd also mentioned to him in that meeting about the Strength in Church Members Committee and Shane M. Bowen being the, the leader of that committee. Uh, and he he played the card of who he's not quite sure about it. But I said uh, in the follow-up email, I also appreciate your willingness to touch base with Elder Bowen of the Strength in Church Members Committee regarding what information they are gathering about me. As discussed, just because you and my local leaders are okay with what I'm doing doesn't mean someone in Salt Lake City isn't watching and preparing something, particularly given the speed with which lawyers acted last time. 
less than 24 hours. And that's a reference to the fact that within 24 hours, the church sent lawyers to take down videos that I'd put up. So, yeah. And those were the videos that you put up about the meeting that those yeah. three apostles mm -hmm. did in England over at the Hyde Park Chapel, right? Yes. Yeah. So I then went and opposed again, this time at state conference. If we could have that video, please, Maven. Wherever Maven's gone. Reading England Stake Centre and via broadcast on the 30th of January, 2022. It's proposed that we sustain as general authorities of the church, Russell M. Nelson as prophet, seer, and revelator, as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Dallin H. Oaks as first counselor in the first presidency, and Henry B. Eyring as second counselor in the first presidency. Those in favor may manifest it by the uplifted hand. Those opposed in any may manifest it. I oppose. The counselors of the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. Those in favor manifest it. Those opposed manifest it. I oppose. Okay, so that's something, I, that's a video I put out then of that opposing vote. Um, but I was starting to hit a bit of a glass ceiling. Uh, my state president was saying that continuing to oppose wouldn't really change anything as the substance of my opposition hadn't changed. And we can't get answers from those who can give answers because at this point we kept coming back to the, the thing that it's a question of intent. It's a question, lying is all about intent. If they in, were intending to deceive, to be dishonest, what they said was factually incorrect, but the question of intent is important. And the only people that can answer that question are those involved in the act. Um, I met with my bishop as well, and he said words to the effect of, it would be great if we could ask the senior brethren directly, but we can't. So I did something a bit different. So your bishop cannot ask the senior leadership a question directly? No. Okay. No. They didn't want to bother them with this. Um, so I found online uh, the email addresses of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. Um, because some of them have signed up to certain websites using their church email address that is then publicly available. Uh, and once you find enough of those, you can work out the naming convention for church email addresses, uh, as Bill very helpfully shared recently, um, which means you can basically email anyone you like. Uh, so I sent a group email on the 17th of February 2022 to all of them, the whole 15. And this is the one I sent to President Oaks. Dear President Oaks. In fact, John, do you want to read this? Yeah. You're muted. Oh, I'm so thankful somebody okay. else got said that too. Here we go. <laughs> this is Douglas Stilgo writing down the jokes, copying Alan Phillips, right? Mm -hmm. And, my and everybody. Everyone. Yeah. Dear President Oaks. Uh, we met once when I was a primary child in the UK. You attended Blank Ward accompanying Blank. Your visit has left a lasting impact on me, and so it is with sadness I write this email. I am, however, thankful for this opportunity to do as my bishop has suggested and contact you with a simple question, a question that my local leaders, despite their best efforts, cannot answer, but which you as prophets here and revelator are perfectly placed to answer. What is the function purpose of opposing vote, the functional purpose of opposing votes when it comes to sustaining senior church leadership. More specifically, what is it to be done by a member of the church if they have cause to oppose the sustaining of senior church leadership and the factual basis of their opposition cannot be resolved by local leadership? Who holds you as an individual accountable for your actions in your position as a prophet, seer, and revelator? In this sense, are sustaining votes a meaningful form of common consent or simply a formality? I have put my question to my bishop, my stake president, to Area 70s, and the Area Presidency, all of whom are copied into this email. Warmest thanks in anticipation of your response, Brother Douglas Stilgo. Yeah, so that's what I sent. Um, I sent it to all of them, uh, and, well, I got a reply. Uh, but first, 
Let's focus on this question. What is to be done by a member of the church if they have cause to oppose the sustaining of senior church leadership and the factual basis of their opposition cannot be resolved by local leadership? That is that is the question, right? And yes. I did indeed get a response from Down Late Jokes. Dear Brother Stilgo, Whoa. I have read your message of February the 17th and would like to respond as asked, but due to the volume of such requests, complying with all of them is not feasible. I hope you will understand. I refer you to section 30.3 of the general handbook where your question is answered. President Dan and Eight Jokes. Now, once I picked my jaw up off the floor, I realized, hang on, does he really think that I've gone through all of this? I've asked all of those people and no one's referred me to the handbook. No one's got, have you tried reading the handbook? <laughs> I'm guessing that's the first place you looked. It's absolutely the first place I looked. So I wrote back to him. Uh, Bill, would you like to read this one? Yeah, I can do that. Let me enlarge the screen. Uh, Dear President Oaks, thank you for taking the time to reply. That section of the handbook had been reviewed and discussed by myself and my stake president prior to my email of 17222. It does not answer the specifics of my question. What is to be done by a member of the church if they have cause to oppose the sustaining of senior church leadership and the factual basis of their opposition cannot be resolved by local leadership? For example, the member has evidence that a senior church leader has made dishonest statements publicly. The local leaders admit the veracity of these facts, but state it was not the intent of senior church leader to be dishonest. When a matter of intent is involved, what is the procedure for resolving the question of intent? Quote, who holds you, comma, as an individual, accountable for your actions in your position as a prophet, seer, and revelator? In this sense, are sustaining votes a meaningful form of common consent or simply a formality? In the March 2020 Enzyme, you said the essential unity. Should I do the Elder Oaks voice? Please. <laughs> The essential unity on doctrine among different leaders is preserved by the long-standing rule that questions addressed to individual apostles or other authorities about doctrine or policy that is not clearly defined in the scriptures or handbooks are to be referred to the first presidency, unquote. Given that neither scripture nor the handbook clearly define the answers to those questions, I must insist you uphold your self-professed long-standing rule, quote unquote, and refer these questions to the first presidency of which you are a member so that we may continue to have, quote, the essential unity of doctrine, unquote. I look forward to your response, Brother Douglas Stilgo. I mean, if in doubt, quote them back to themselves, right? That's you're telling the, them, I just want to say you're the telling them their own gosh. rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what were you going to say, RFM? It's just a minor point of order. I just want to make sure it's clear for the record that this was sent on March 2nd, 2022. Yep. Yes, indeed. There's a timeline. It's yep. coming up all the way up to almost today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I thought that's a bit cheeky, but saying back to him, I mean, using your self-professed long-standing rule, I thought was a bit much, but it seemed to work because um, I got a response. <laughs> Can't believe it. So I'll read oh, it. from Brooke P. Hales, though. This is from Brooke P. Hales. <laughs> you just talked okay. them into following their own rules. They did it. Elder yeah. Oaks takes it back to the first presidency, and now Brooke yeah. Hales is writing you with their response. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So was Brooke, was Brooke Hales CC'd in your nope. original email? I had no idea who he so was. this had to be referred point. to them. Yeah. Okay, so it was referred to him. Okay. Yes. So, hit me, dear hit Brother me. Stilgo, I have been asked to respond to your further question addressed to President Dallin H. Oaks. I don't like the fact he calls it a further question. It's the first question I asked him. There's no this. I'm not asking extras. I'm just asking for my actual question to be answered. Anyway, a copy of this email is being sent to President Blank for his information. Subtle threat. Now, that's you the asked, state president, right? Yeah, that's the state president. Okay. You asked, what is to be done by a member of the church if they have cause to oppose the sustaining of senior church leadership and the factual basis of their opposition cannot be resolved by local leadership? I did indeed ask that. That was my question. Good points. So my question's about to get an answer. The response is, 
that one should meet with his or her state president to present the information to him. The state president would then forward that information to the office of the first presidency. Once one does that, his or her obligation and the obligation of the state president are fulfilled. The information would be carefully investigated and appropriate action taken based on the evidence presented and the investigation of the facts. It is hoped this answers your question. Sincerely, Brooke P. Hales. No, it did. It Secretary did answer my question. Secretary to the First Presidency. Yes, Secretary to the First Presidency. But we had a bit of back and forth because, you know, I was, I've, I've got someone. I've got the Secretary to the First Presidency answering my emails, so I'm going to see what I can get. So uh, I haven't included all of these emails, but I asked him what would happen if one of the brethren involved in the accusation was also one of the ones responsible for the need for the investigation or, or for doing the investigating. Um, is that not a conflict of interest? For example... Yeah. A member of the first presidency is lying and is investigating himself for lying we went back and forth on that a little bit uh can, can, can i stop you for just yeah. a second Nemo? Mm -hmm. it seems apparent to me that the way they've created this circular reasoning this process that the way it works mm -hmm. is that technically every member of the church could raise their hand in an opposing vote mm -hmm. and as long as these guys say they took care of it it's done and over with, and they can continue business as usual. Yeah. Okay, just so we're clear. <laughs> yes. Uh, right, and so, I'll just add that that, that yeah. email to you from uh, the secretary mm -hmm. sounds like a long version of don't call us, we'll call you. Yes, it does. Yeah. It's a real attempt to fob off. And I didn't, so we had a bit of back and forth. And bless him, he, he did engage me until we got to this one, um, which this is a gem. Dear Brother Stilgo, thank you for your further inquiry. Unfortunately, I do not know the answers to your questions, nor do I have the time to research them simply in order to satisfy your curiosity. If such a situation were to arise, obviously important decisions would need to be made by those who have the authority to do so. The appropriate parties would be informed as needed. Sincerely, Brooke P. Hales. Right, um, he's getting a little bit feisty. Uh, again... Mm. If the issue is serious, which it seems like if the integrity and ethics of the top 15 leadership is such mm -hmm. that they that there is a large chunk of them, if not the majority of them, who have been dishonest on one or more occasions mm -hmm. and such is withholding information in such a way as to manipulate people and deceive them, it it seems as though that would be a serious matter and not a small thing, which they seem to want to be playing this off as. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, 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 I gave him it back. Um, <clears throat> dear Elder Hales, thank you for your quick response and for your honesty regarding your lack of answers to my questions. <laughs> <laughs> my questions are not asked simply out of curiosity. I wish it were so. They come from a need to understand the procedure that is in place when a member raises legitimate concerns regarding the public behavior of members of the Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency and how they are held accountable for those behaviors. They come because such a situation has indeed arisen. My state president will forward these concerns in due course. So it would be <laughs> beneficial to continue researching the answers to these questions as we have successfully been doing together. And I'm grateful for your commitment to doctrinal unity thus far. I know you must be busy, and I'm grateful for your time, though I would ask if you, in your position within the office of the First Presidency, do not have time to research answers to questions of such gravity, then who does? Warmest regards, Brother Stoker. <laughs> Dear. I mean, are, what are, else can you say, right? Are you being amazed right now by your own cheekiness? I am a little bit, yeah. I, can't, I, I'm, I haven't read some of these in a little while, and I'm, I'm a bit, yeah. I'm well, a I'll tell you that from my I, perspective, I you from my perspective, you have balls of British steel. At least grapefruits. <laughs> John, aren't you? You know, I watched the as I've watched the slideshow, I, I know where it goes, you know. But I'm a little jealous that you know I didn't handle things this way. Um Yeah. Did, did you have that thought at all? Yeah, as as I've um as I as I've you know, Nemo and I have been corresponding about this a little bit uh, throughout throughout the past several months. And, um, well, actually, it, when I got off my mission, I had had a corrupt mission experience. And ironically, I wrote a letter to Elder Oaks. And I told him about the corruption on my mission. 
And uh, one of the surprises of my life was that when I was doing Washington seminar in Washington, D.C. for BYU, I got a call that said, uh, this is LDS Church headquarters. Can you hold for Elder Oaks, please? And Elder Oaks actually called me and responded directly to my letter. And at the time, I considered it one of the great surprises and honors of my membership. Um, so, you know, that came to mind when Nemo was corresponding with Elder Oaks. I'm like, wow, you too, huh? Um, but, but I, I, I was surprised at how kind of insubordinate, uh, but also courageous Nemo was coming across, but I was even more surprised that they were giving him the time of day because normally my experience over the past 20 years is that you write church headquarters, they route it to your Bishop and stake president and you never hear from them. So this was quite, uh, so this has been quite surprising for me to see yeah. both Nemo's tenacity and that the church is actually, and Elder Oaks, no less, is actually responding. That's very surprising. And I think the only reason it's gone as far as it has is because Nemo told them about their very own rules and imposed that they follow them. Yeah. Yeah, probably. It's brilliant. I mean, it's brilliant, right? <laughs> and so what we have out of all this is an established flowchart. Um, and if, if, if no one takes anything else away from this presentation, like screenshot this, share this with like every member, you know, this is as established by Brooke P. Hales of the first office of the first presidency, who was authorized to communicate with me by Dan H. Oaks. Dan H. Oaks asked him to, to give me that answer. This here is the flow chart you need to follow if you have an opposing vote. Okay. I'll read it out. Member opposes the sustaining of senior church leadership in ward or state conference. So you then meet with the state president and discuss the evidence. Can the state president resolve the factual nature of your concerns? Yes? Then it's all good. No? The state president sends your evidence to the first presidency. And then the office of the first presidency investigates. That is, that is the structure now. That is the new glass ceiling. Don't let any state president tell you it goes no further than them. Because it doesn't. It can it, it can and should go all the way to the office of the First Presidency. That's the precedent now. Because I'm British and we work on that system. Very good. I think you single-handedly made an addendum to the handbook. Yeah. It, it's, at some point, huh? <laughs> so this is going to go up on my Instagram. This is like, share the heck out of this. Um, because this is important. It's important that people know they can't just be held down like that. Um, and so this has all been going on. And Alan Phillips reached out again and wanted to meet because, you know, clearly the area presidency of getting a little bit of pressure from Salt Lake going, hey, what's going on with this guy? Um, it's important to, to note at this point, Alan Phillips got it. When I sent the original um, set of 15 emails, the kind of the, the cold call emails, um, I called out President in the one to President Nelson. I called him out about the plane of death story. Um, Holland, I called him out for lying. Uh, I, I like in those. I called them out. I, I said, I said to Holland, "You once spoke about honesty so powerfully it brought me to tears. Imagine then my disappointment to find you'd been dishonest with members of the church." You know, I was writing stuff like this to them, um, and Alan Phillips got a phone call on a Friday night from Jeffrey R. Holland, going, "What's going on over there? What's what's going on? How can I help?" So this this permeated the the top fifteen, uh, which is it's crazy to me to think. Um, so Alan wanted to meet, so I stepped into the arena with an area seventy, my state president, and my bishop. Uh, and like I said, my state president, I said at the beginning, my state president, and my bishop have been lovely during this, and they've been you know trying to help. Um, so that's why they've been playing along so far. Uh, and then we had that meeting. And if John could read this, this is my uh, response. Then they got this is what got sent to um, my state president afterwards because we had the meeting and we agreed that we would send the evidence to the office of the first presidency. All right, this is March thirty first, twenty twenty two. Dear President Blank, thank you again for taking the time to attend the meeting on Monday night. This is Doug or Nemo speaking. I am particularly aware that all three of you were away from your families on family home evening, and I'm grateful for that sacrifice. 
I've done my best to be as objective and respectful as possible whilst directly addressing the evidence for my concerns about the honesty of senior church leaders. I understand this document is likely to cause some discomfort in much the same way my mother was nervous about me reaching out to the brethren. It goes against much of our cultural upbringing to directly acknowledge any negative behavior of senior church leaders, but together we can bravely peruse this inquiry and we have the backing of Elder Phillips and Elder Hales to do so. On that note, I would like to reiterate my need to be cc'd into your sending of this letter to the office of the First Presidency. I have the email address of everyone involved, so there should be no privacy concerns or privacy, as you would say, on that front. I also trust that their response to this letter will be shared directly with me or via yourself. I'm so grateful that you are willing to support me on this journey of inquiry, and it is my prayer that we will both be strengthened by the truths that come to light. All the best, Brother Douglas. Still go. There you go. Thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, I can't wait to see the document that you attached and sent to your state president to be forwarded on to the first presidency for investigation. Yeah. All this talk about a letter or a document, um, it would only be fair for me to share it with you. Now, there will be a dramatic reading of this at some point. Um, it is a three and a half thousand word document that I compiled. There's enough dishonesty to fill three and a half thousand words. And as people <laughs> know about me by now, I'm quite succinct with my words. So it's there's quite a lot of lies in there. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it now, but I'll talk you through the main points of it. Um, so it was addressed to my state president. Um, so it starts, Dear President Blank, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I am hereby opposing the sustaining of Russell Marion Nelson, Dallin Harris Oaks, and Henry Benyon Eyring as prophets, seers, and revelators. In addition, I oppose the sustaining of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. This letter constitutes an overview of the evidence for that opposition. As per our meeting together with Bishop Blank and Elder Phillips, and in accordance with the instruction from Elder Brooke P. Hales that we received, this will be forwarded to the Office of the First Presidency to seek a resolution of these concerns. These are no trivial concerns, such as, and this is a quote from my state president, evidence that President Nelson was washing his car on a Sunday. Rather, they pertain to a clear and repeated pattern of dishonest behavior amongst the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. Um, and then I go on to, to mention how, uh, you know, there is an actively propagated narrative by senior church leaders that they will always teach the truth. And uh, the rhetoric of infallibility comes through in talks such as Henry B. Eyring's Power of Sustaining Faith, where... He talks about how it is a sin we must repent of to think or speak of human weaknesses in the people we pledge to sustain. So I said, by the mouths of two or three witnesses, uh, will the truth be established? So I gave the three most prominent lies. So the first is Dallin H. Oaks did not speak truthfully at the University of Virginia Q&A session in 2021 when he said, let me say about electroshock treatments at BYU. When I became president at BYU, that had been discontinued earlier and it never went on under my administration. And then I lay out when he was president at BYU, when the studies, the, the Max McBride study came out, uh, and then some executive committee meeting minutes where a booklet was discussed about this topic and President Oaks was um, involved. Witness two is Jeffrey O'Holland saying in a 2012 Harvard Q&A, institutionally not a single dollar, not one red cent of money from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints went into Proposition 8 or any other comparable proposition that I know of. And then I laid out in detail that according to the California Secretary of State, the church spent $223,940.85, 85 red cents on Proposition 8. <laughs> and so they had to file a major donor report. And so, and I went into this detail, $157,706.28 in church employee time had to be paid for. Audiovisual production worth $30,806 had to be paid for. L. Whitney Clayton was reimbursed for travel to the tune of $4,478. The church paid all this money. So that's not true. Witness three was M. Russell Ballard in a 2017 face-to-face -face event saying there has been no attempt on the part of church leaders to hide anything from anybody. Now, that's untrue because images of Wilford Woodruff's 1867 journal are redacted on the church website to hide mentions of the second anointing. And why would you redact documents if you're not trying to hide things? A transcript of the original text from a different website 
re- confirms that the redacted parts are indeed references to the second anointing. Then I talk about the improvement area article and the problem with that, the 1832 account being hidden away um, in uh, a vault for decades. And then I thought, well, that's not enough. Let me just outline all the other dishonesty I know about. So I've got a section further witnesses. So the plane of death, um, a speech that prophets always teach the truth and then lay out that blood atonement and the Adam God doctrine were taught by Brigham Young. So what gives with that? And then I also laid out that the church has disavowed those teachings. And then Dallin H. Oates giving the justification for the salamander in the salamander letter, which why would he justify something that just wasn't true? Um, Nemo, I've got, yeah. before you continue, can mm-hmm. you just go back for a second? You're doing sure. a great job and I appreciate That's your right. synopsizing these things. But can you give a little bit more detail for those who might not be familiar with mm-hmm. it, with um, uh, when you say President Nelson's plane of death? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, President Nelson, um, well, you guys broke this in half. Uh, essentially, you really opened it up. So I'll read what I wrote in the letter. President Nelson has told this story multiple times, the plane of death, in which he was in a small aircraft, an engine of which caught fire, burning fuel spewed over the plane, and then it went into a spiral dive. Quote, I expected to die, he said. He tells this story as a miraculous tale of the engine fire being extinguished by the dive and still arriving at the meeting on time. Much like the stories of Paul H. Dunn, this faith-promoting tale was not entirely truthful. Records of the flight in question, which experienced a rough engine and made an emergency landing in Delta, Utah, do not corroborate the death-defying tale Russell Nelson shares. And anywhere you see something underlined in this um in this document is a hyperlink that hyperlink will take you straight to the evidence for the statement i'm making so when i say paul h dunn it goes to the news article about paul h dunn basically giving that public apology um you know where it says records of the flight in question it goes to the flight records this is simple stuff for them to to look through i made it as easy as possible for them um so yeah there was that then we go to emerald or ballard who's talking about how like some missionaries have felt pressure to invite people to be baptized in the first lesson and church leaders don't know where that came from. I've pointed out that he should know exactly where it came from because he was involved in creating Preach My Gospel. Um, so, you know, that's not honest. Quinton L. Cook talking about the scriptures being clear about slavery. Again, not true. DNC 134.12. They don't believe it's just to preach to slaves. Uh, Neil L. Anderson visited Zimbabwe's president and said that we're not a rich people, even though the Enzyme Peak Fund stood at 100 billion and the GDP of Zimbabwe at the time was 19.2, so Enzyme Peak was five times the size of the GDP of the country he was in. I mean, that's not a good look. And then one of my personal favorites, Gary E. Stevenson at the NAACP luncheon, saying that one of our recent church manuals included a paragraph with some outdated commentary about race. It was mistakenly included in the printed version of the manual, which had been prepared for print nearly two years ago. When it was brought to the attention of church leaders late last year, they directed that it be immediately removed in our annual online manual, which is used by the great majority of our members. We've also directed that any future printed manuals will reflect this change. This is the key bit. We are asking our members to disregard the paragraph in the printed manual, he added. I'm not aware of any direction or any communication to members of the church to disregard the paragraph in question. No letter from the First Presidency, Quorum of the Twelve, or General Sunday School Presidency was read over the pulpit. Instructions for Curriculum 2020 say nothing about disregarding the paragraph in question. The online version of the manual does not instruct members to disregard the print version in relation to the aforementioned paragraph. It's dishonest to tell the attendees of an NAACP luncheon that you're instructing members to disregard racially offensive materials in a church study manual and then fail to actually instruct those members to do so. Boom. And then here's the addendums at the back. So that's showing uh, the Wilford Woodruff uh, journal being redacted there. You can see um, here is some more redactions. Here is the adhesive tape on the spine of the page to fix Joseph Smith's 1832 account back in. That is Bill Reel's list of all the times Russell M. Nelson or others have told the story about the plane of death. Cheers for that, Bill. And then here is the mentions of uh, the invitation to be baptized in both the 2004 and 2018 edition of Preach My Gospel. And Ballard's been part of the missionary committee Mm -hmm. for long periods of time. And probably when he says, I don't know where people started inviting in the first discussion 
to invite uh, investigators to be baptized, it almost assuredly he was in the room when that was decided that that would be put into a manual. Absolutely. That's the point I make. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And I should say one more thing here, which is yep. when common consent is originally placed uh, in, in place, uh, RFM does a great job of this in the apostolic coup d'etat episodes, but you have the standing a high council, which is the Nauvoo stake. Uh, I think it's William Marks is the president of the stake and they are of equal authority to the patriarch mm -hmm. of equal authority to the traveling high council, which is the quorum of the 12 mm -hmm. and equal authority of the first presidency. And you can tell by the way the church was originally organized that if some concern came up about Joseph Smith or Sidney Rigdon, it got passed along to one of the other committees. Now mm -hmm. what the church has done is the apostles are everybody. The first presidency are apostles. The apostles are, you know, themselves, obviously. And and any concern that of them is handled by them. And that is mm -hmm. simply a distortion from the original way the church was organized. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Absolutely. That my stake president sent that document. What a brave man. Like I want to applaud him for actually <laughs> another set of grapes. Doing that, yeah. Right? He if he only we knew that. his name. Yeah. Well, you know, I've got, I've got to spare him something in the the impending firestorm that will come out of this. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> despite my request to be CC'd in, I wasn't, but the it, the it was then forwarded to me. So that I just I think my state president couldn't quite handle that level of me gaming the system. Like I I think he knew that the senior brethren wouldn't like seeing me CC'd into that message. As petty as that is of them, I think he knew that, and so he didn't. Um, he could have BCC'd you. He could have, but that's sneaky. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, though, my stake president changed the narrative from following the instructions to the office of the first presidency to the, to the, the stake presidency not being able to satisfy my questions, and so I have asked for a document to be sent. So again, he's kind of starting to step back here. He's not wanting to get caught up. There's some slight sneaky changes. Um, and you can see that here. This, um, who would like to read this bottom one here? Um, RFM, please read this bottom one. Thank you. So this is from April 13th, 2022, from your stake president to you. Hi, Doug. Mm -hmm. Here's the outgoing message as requested. So now he's sending you uh, the message mm -hmm. that he sent to them, which had your document attached to it, correct? Mm -hmm. I sent it to the office of the first presidency and CC'd Elder Phillips. As you can see, I changed the name of the attachment as I felt a name connected with the title of the email would be helpful. I'll let you know on further developments. Stake president. Just before you jump on, the original title of the attachment was Evidence of Dishonesty. So I feel like he wanted to change the, the title of the attachment. Not for that reason, but because he thought it was inflammatory. And because he's <laughs> the one sending it on. So maybe, yeah. maybe he's worried about it sounding like he's the one who's also accusing. Again, totally fair. Yeah. Did it did he change the title to We Love You First Presidency? No, he changed it to Opposing Vote. Can, oh, can I ask okay. you another so question? Kind of neutral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you're please. talking to as you're talking to your bishop, I assume you mm -hmm. went to him first. Yeah. Okay. And then you go to your stake president. Your stake president is kindly following the process. And on some level, he's like, Yeah, this is your right. Let's send it on. Mm -hmm. We well, should get an answer. Both gone, oh, if only we could ask them. And I've jumped back on that point that they said and uh, said, well, now we can, so let's yep. do it. Yep. Yeah. As you're having all these conversations with your stake president, can you sense whether he is looking at this data and going like, ooh, it does look like these guys are dishonest, or, or is he just really portraying, at least to you, again, who knows what goes on inside someone's head, is he portraying to you like business as usual? Hmm... He, he's he's pushing back and i spent half of my conversations like having to really argue they, they would they would take it down little roads of oh well what does this word mean or what does that word mean it's typical apologetic oh, yeah. stuff they would they'd yeah. try and root me down and i'm quite good at bringing them back to the point what is a burning engine on fire mean anyway anyway yeah oh <laughs> oh i had the whole 9 11 thing thrown at me some people swear they saw 9 11 happen one way and actually it didn't and people's was memories on the of plane. events, right? You know, people's <laughs> memories of events change, and so memory isn't reliable. Da da da. Imagine confronting someone about the fact that 
someone's told an infl- uh, like an inflated story, and they're like, "Yeah, but what is memory? What what is you know?" So I'll do Terrell Givens. Well, that's what if Stephen you make Harper's some allowance. The first vision now. Pardon? I was saying that's what Stephen Harper is doing with the first vision now. Yeah. What yeah. is memory? What is memory? Um, so that that was a lot of what was going on. Um, I don't think this is shaken by local leaders particularly because I think they're so both so adept in kind of the gymnastics of because they're both thoughtful guys. They are both um, and they're both very aware of. So the ward I'm in is um, is a very nuanced ward. It's a place where I'm able to be myself in Sunday school and it's fine and you don't get that everywhere. So I think they've got their ways of coping with people like me and I, you know what, I'll, I'll let them let them get on with it. Yeah. Are we to your response? Are your stake president's yeah, response? Yeah, yeah. So, so this bit at the bottom is what the stake president sent to the office of the first presidency. Okay. Consistent with the direction at general conference for members to express their opposing votes to their stake president, I have received the attached communication from a member of the reading stake. Oops. Reading. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the stake. Anyway, right. I have been working with Brother Stilgo for some time along with Bishop Blank and Elder Phillips to help resolve multiple concerns he has expressed, in particular regarding historic and recent communications from senior church leaders. I have counseled with Brother Stilgo to express that even if the basis he asserts for his concerns are valid, such concerns would not disqualify any leader from serving in the church. It's like, don't worry, I don't think think you're bad, guys. It's just him. I don't think you're bad. It's just this guy. Please, brethren, don't be mad at me. I've already said all his concerns aren't problematic. It's just he wants them answered. That's what that is. Why won't you let them be fallible? Mm. Oh, we'll get to that, Bill. We'll get to that. He appears to be saying that um, serial dishonesty does not disqualify one from leadership in the LDS Mm -hmm. church. Yeah. So such concerns would not disqualify any leader from serving in the church. However, despite best efforts with that brother still go, we have not been able to provide answers to his satisfaction. And he has asked that I forward these concerns to the office of the first presidency. I will continue to work with Bishop Blank in helping brother still go make the steps necessary to fulfill his expressed desire to return to the temple. While this may be a long journey, I hope that this blessing can be available to him in the future signed state president yeah so he's holding and that's the where he attaches the uh, the document but i let some of this go because i was like you know what then fine if, if this means it's going to the senior church leaders if this means it's going to the office of first presidency then i'm almost past my state president at this point now because like it doesn't matter what narrative he gives around this letter that document's going to be in front of their bare retina and they're going to look at it and then they're gonna they're gonna give me an answer of some kind because at this point all all bets are off we're through the looking glass i have no idea what's gonna happen because all of this is unprecedented as some of you have expressed like them even giving me the time of day is unprecedented so all bets are off uh and i thought you know i'll probably get an answer which i did dallin h oaks was assigned to investigate the claims in my letter and in fact investigate himself Pardon? <laughs> We're saying the same thing. Go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Just know that that he's Dallin Oaks has been assigned to investigate himself. I'm sure that goes well. Yeah. So this is from my state president. He said, uh, "Hi, Doug. Just to update you, I had a brief phone call yesterday from President Oaks. At this point, notice how things have changed from um, things have changed from being written down to being com- communicated verbally." Um. And he let me know that he had the assignment regarding the questions raised in your letter. He apologized for the delay in making contact following general conference and indicated he would come back with a response as soon as he could, highlighting that the question will require some investigation. Dallin H. Oaks said, my questions will require some investigation. Dallin H. Oaks said to my state president that he would be investigating the questions raised in my letter. That is what he said he would do. Just bear that in mind. That's what he said he would do. Then my state president goes on, I'm conscious that President Oaks has many other responsibilities, so I'm not sure when that response may come. However, it was very clear to me that President Oaks wants to help support you in your desire to return to the temple. Of course. Fine. I'll keep you appraised of developments. Okay. 
Three months later, Dan Lake Church responded. Now, I do not know how to... I don't know how to do this next part other than just to get Bill to read it in the voice of Dan Lake Jokes. Are you ready, Bill? I, I'll try. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, three months, a promise to investigate a three and a half thousand word document with evidence, and this is what we get. Dear Brother Stilgo, thank you for your message of August 2nd and appropriate follow-up since you have not heard an answer from me. On July 6th, I sent President so-and-so a lengthy letter suggesting how he talked to you about this subject and giving a reference to the public study that concluded I had not lied in my response at the University of Virginia. I'm sure you will be hearing from him, and that is the help I promise to give you. You have my best wishes. Sincerely, President Dallin H. Oaks. That is not what he promised to do. For a start. Secondly, why is he making an appeal to an external authority on a matter of his own honesty? Why can he not say he didn't lie? Why is he pointing me to a public study that concluded he didn't lie in his response to the University of Virginia? I want all of your thoughts on this. Well, I'll go first. I think it's interesting that you made various claims against various individuals, one of which was Elder Oaks, and that seems to be the only one he's interested in addressing. And I, I, I pointed out multiple lies that he'd told, and he's only picked on one. John, your thoughts? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of speechless. RFM, I want to hear RFM go. I just went. <laughs> How about Bill? Bill, what do you think? Um, number one, I did, I wouldn't have expected it to be anything more or less than what you got. Number one, <laughs> Num- number two is you put out multiple claims. I don't know how many there were seven, eight, and, uh, yeah, and you, yeah. and there are plenty of others you could have put. There's the elder Holland. We're going double digit state creation every week of our lives. I didn't want know. to double down on Holland too much. Totally. No, <laughs> I totally. I, a, you know where that gets you. <laughs> he's a giving well. <laughs> so, um, you, you have multiple claims with solid evidence that the leaders of the church have significant dishonesty, at least at least significant uh, examples of dishonesty. And you would expect that if the church were going to operate in legit ways, at the very minimum, they would have to get back to you and give some sort of response to each of those, even if those responses were bullshit, such as Elder Oaks telling you that he just misremembered. Um, mm-hmm. such as uh, Elder Ballard saying he's got early stage dementia and doesn't know of the 25 examples that he should know of where the things have been hidden since him and Elder Oaks know all the leaders of the church since the beginning, which is also impossible. Um, it, it seems as though you should have gotten something much bigger than this, and the fact that you got this seems to um, definit- definitively tell you that they have no interest in addressing your questions at all. Yeah, because let's just not be too hard on Elder Oaks, okay? Because he did refer you at least to a public study that concluded he did not lie. And and I want to say something there too. The only person who knows whether Elder Oaks lied or not is Elder Oaks inside of his own head. And you have the chance to have Elder Oaks himself tell you he's telling the truth or he's lying or he misremembers. And instead, like you said, he points you to an external source who couldn't possibly know what the hell is in Elder Oaks' head. Oh, I yeah, I will we'll go there. But it's just, it's so uh, insulting, frankly, to look at a three and a half thousand word document and think that that is enough reply. It also I tells mean, you that all of those things might be real because the fact well, that they don't want to address them at all gives actual substance to the argument. Mm-hmm. I mean, Oaks is on record saying we neither, you know, seek nor offer apologies. Uh, You know, I've worked with attorneys enough in RFM, you can tell me if I'm wrong, where, you know, one of the rules of 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 engaging in in any sort of litigation is don't don't ever provide additional evidence. Right. So he's not going to want to actually try and and respond to your claims because he'll be introducing more evidence 
uh, of potential deception or dishonesty. Um, and honestly, he probably views you as impertinent. He doesn't, you're just a minion. He doesn't see you as worthy of, of actually engaging. He probably wrote this thoughtlessly as he was rushing out the door. And it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to one little thing. Maybe he even didn't fully read it. Um, but certainly he's not going to want to engage in a point by point, um, you know, r rebuttal with you. Number one, because he'd probably lose. Number two, you'd probably use it against him on the internet. And number three, I wouldn't do such a thing, John. He wouldn't, he wouldn't want to, he wouldn't want to spend his time that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, do you want to suggest that if he had said, I, my memory was bad, I misremembered. Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be using that against him right now. Yeah. You'd be showing it and saying, this is a good thing and yeah. good for president Oaks. Wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be like good, good for you. Like he owned up, he owned it. Yeah. This is why I'm sharing this. Cause this is, this is important. Anyone who puts their trust or their faith in these men that they have answers to the questions, anyone that gets told by a local leader, Oh, the brethren could ask you a question. It's just a shame. We can't get to them. I got to them. I got them to answer my questions, and this is what I got. I, they asked me to send that document. They asked me to send the evidence. They asked for it, and then they didn't even have the decency to answer it properly. Um, here's the public study, everyone. Um, it's right here on this hyperlink. What does that hyperlink say, John? Hyperlink says fairlatterdaysaints.org, aversion therapy at BYU. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So um, this is from my state president. He said, and we were arranging a meeting to discuss this, whatever this is. I'll also check with Bishop Blank on timing and location, but as a starting point, I'd propose 8 p.m. at Blank Chapel on August 17th. President Oaks, in the email he sent you, made reference to a public study which can be found using this link. The remainder of his letter was directed to me, highlighting some general principles regarding common consent and the fallibility of church leaders, which we can touch on at our meeting. Looking forward to meeting next week. Blank. Now, my state president still maintains, every time I ask to see this letter, that it was for him. It's not for me. But what I want to know is why is the outcome of a question I asked nothing to do with me? I wonder what's in that letter. Um, here's the public study. And the really important bit is at the bottom here. There is no evidence President Oaks had knowledge of the research during his time as president at BYU. BYU is a large university with many students conducting many research projects. There is no reason why Oaks would have known about the research and no evidence that he did know. Now, what did I say earlier, gentlemen? What did I say earlier in my document about, oh, well, here's the evidence that Dan H. Oaks would have known about it. I, I did say that, didn't I? In fact, I do what, believe I did his include position? evidence. What's his position at the school? His position is president. President the of the school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then, and then this, this piece of paper. Yeah, this is Connell O'Donovan, uh, that wonderful chap. Uh, these are some documents. Who's that? That name there? And describe for for the. This list is a document. document. Yeah, this is a document that uh, is talking about a booklet that had been produced. Um, this is a booklet that had been produced about what was going on at BYU at the time. There was contemporary pushback at the time to it. And there was council meetings convened at BYU to talk about the public reaction to what had been going on. And so in that, as president of BYU, Dallin H. Oaks was CC'd in. And if you're looking at this, you can see a little bit of a, a circle. So he knew that there was of electroshock aversion therapy going on at BYU because he was part of meetings discussing the public out outcry. And yeah. then here's one, here's another letter which he sent to Elder Packer, again regarding a magazine, The Advocate, that had been talking about everything that had been going on. Sincerely, Dan H. Oaks, signed by him. Huh. And both of those from 1978, correct? Yeah. Which is when, when it, while he was president, from 71 to 80? Mm hmm. Okay. So, so when Fair Borman says there is no evidence President Oaks had knowledge, in the three and a half thousand word document I sent to him, there are letters included in my references. This is evidence that he did have a knowledge. This is evidence they would have to fight back against to say it's not true. Even so, if the documents so, are completely fabricated, they need to say, well, that's, that evidence is not true. 
it's not a good enough position to say there's no evidence because I'm showing you some. If Elder Oaks promised to do an investigation and they took any of these claims seriously, again, he's investigating himself, but mm -hmm. you would click the link. I would click the links and I would have to see what the evidence is. Mm -hmm. And I would notice that I've essentially signed off that I knew these things. Mm. Yeah. yeah there's, well, no, to... there's zero oh. question that Elder Oaks knew about this research uh, project going on at BYU in the 70s. There's, it's it's undeniable. Right. It's irrefutable, right. and it's very lawyerly. It's very lawyerly, lawyerly to say, uh, you know, I have no memory, or it, it's 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 clearly just a smokescreen uh, mm -hmm. to try and evade responsibility. In my view. So, do any of you think this could get worse at this point? <laughs> I'm guessing it does. By the oh, way, yeah. Nemo, it's mm -hmm. as if you accuse me of lying about something that I said on a podcast, mm -hmm. and instead of answering you and saying no i didn't lie here's what it was or yeah i misspoke or whatever instead i refer you to a podcast that was done by bill real over at mm -hmm. mormon discussions that says yeah. there's no evidence that i lied but i'm not going to answer your question directly that is essentially what happened yeah and also our rfm and, and nemo and bill when he calls it a public you know study or a public document that's weird because this is an apologetic document written by a volunteer who is a defender of the faith. And he's kind of casting it as if it's a neutral, objective kind of study. Public study. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you think that's playing on the naiveness of the local leadership, right? The they average, don't know what Fair Mormon yeah. is and the they're average. not like us. Yeah. yeah Fortunately, yeah. my local leaders do know what Fair Mormon is. So when I met with them, I called it out and they were like, yeah. Yeah. Well, it is public. What can we do? And it is so, a study. <laughs> yeah, those two things are technically true. Um, <laughs> but I discovered that the letter that was sent to my state president, because it was sent, it was a physical letter that was sent. It wasn't an email. It's a physical letter. I discovered it, and it, it, it contained um, some general principles regarding common consent and the fallibility of church leaders, which we can touch on at the meeting. I discovered that that letter was destroyed. So we weren't really able to touch on these things at the meeting because that letter had been th apparently thrown away like the rest of his post. Wait a second. How did you find out about this? State president told me. I asked, when where's the letter? Then? Yeah, when we met, I said, can you bring the letter? Because I want to I want to look at it. I want to read Elder Oaks's counsel firsthand because you said there's some counsel in there. And I, I want to read his thoughts on the principles of fallibility and of what it means to sustain your church leaders. Um, and he said, I can't because I've thrown it away. Like the rest of my post, it's gone. I read it a couple of times and now it's gone. Now, I don't think that's necessarily the truth. I wonder whether he was told to get rid of it. Because it's not well, the first time on that, that because a prophet has told someone to burn a letter. Of course he was told to. Yeah, of course he was told to. What state president is going to get a letter from President Oaks with his signature on it, presumably, and he's mm -hmm. going to then destroy it? During there's an ongoing process. That happens. During an ongoing yeah, process. Yeah. Yes, there's only Before one way that happens. Before he's even sat down and discussed with me. Yeah, El uh, President Oaks told him to destroy that letter. That's and the I'll only reasonable explanation to me. And I want to share in my experience, when I appealed my excommunication, and Bill, maybe you had the same experience, um, you know, it was a direct letter to the first presidency saying, hey, I, I, you know, I disagree with this excommunication. What I got was either a phone call or an email back from my state president saying, I received a letter from the first presidency. Um, they have denied your appeal. Uh, and that's all. And I said, well, can I have a copy of the letter? And he said, no. <laughs> and that's, you know, the, again, it's this idea, you know, Oaks is lawyer in chief and you don't want to create evidence because again, mm -hmm. a letter signed by the first presidency saying we reject your appeal. It's almost like a validation that you exist. It's a validation that you appealed. It's a validation that they rejected your appeal and it's visual. And, you know, this isn't just in an internet age, but I think RFM just in a in a lawyerly engagement, you just don't want evidence, right? Mm. 
Well, can I tell you that when you're a lawyer, and I hope President Oaks is listening or somebody on his behalf who can pass the message along. Well, they're listening. Elder Oaks knows this. Whenever you write a letter to an opposing party or in any kind of correspondence related to a case, you're writing it to the other side, but you're also writing it to the judge because you always have to take into account the fact that this letter, if it is not well worded, could be used as an exhibit and brought to the attention of the judge. And you want to make sure that anything that you write to the other side is going to be looked at approvingly by a judge. And that's what Elder Oak should have done in this letter, was simply write something that would be fine for the public to know what is it in this letter that has to be so secret that the letter itself must be destroyed. Mm. And I was talking with Bill about this earlier. He had an idea that had not occurred to me. Go on, Bill. Yeah, so in our conversation talking, and somebody already made reference to it, by the way. Let me see if I can find the the comment up here. Uh, comments are coming so fast and furious at this point. There's 733 people in here watching, which is, I think, a high for us. Um, but I think it's one of the Partridge sisters, and uh, Joseph writes uh, Partridge parents asking them to bring the Partridge sister uh, along uh, and again, critics argue that it's for an intimate interaction. Uh, apologists argue that that's not the case. But regardless, um, uh, Joseph Smith tells the family to destroy the letter when uh, it's all said and done, which I don't think that happened. I think the letter still exists. But they were told to destroy the letter. Um, and so it is. there is a precedent uh, for this type of behavior where we ask people to destroy documents, again, which also adds to the problem of Elder Ballard saying we've never hit anything because here's just one more time that we're hiding something. Yes, indeed. RFM, you're muted, I do believe. It's just uh, clacking away furiously on my keyboard to do some research. I think that um, at least Sarah Ann Whitney in a letter regarding her and bringing her out to see him you know, make sure come out now because Emma's not around and uh, and destroy this letter, by the way. So, so at least Elder Oaks, if it, indeed, yeah. yeah, if indeed Elder Oaks did write that in the letter, he either wrote it in the letter or he told him on the phone. But if he hasn't destroyed the letter, it's probably in the letter. No state and, president is destroying that. Like you said, no, yeah. nobody that, that's absolutely not going to happen. Not during an ongoing process for sure. Hmm. It's so obvious. Back when I was in the prosecutor's office back in the 1990s, this is in Washington state, right? And we've got a guy arrested on a California warrant. He refuses to waive extradition. So we have to get what's called a governor's warrant in order to have him extradited back to California. And we get that governor's warrant at the prosecutor's office. And it has the signature on it of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Believe it or not, we didn't throw that away. We actually posted it up on the wall because that was a prize. He's not throwing this away unless he's told to, and he's gotta to be told to by somebody with at least the authority of President Oaks, who's the first counselor in the first presidency. So it was either mm -hmm. President Nelson or President Oaks, and I doubt it was President Nelson. Yep. So um, I just, uh, on the point, he mentioned prophetic fallibility, and that's gonna be a theme that's gonna come up in a moment. Um, I just want to remind everyone in the audience the explicit idea in the earliest church that leaders are to be trusted. They're a trusted source of truth and information. If we could get the next video, please, Maven. Listen to sources you can trust. Seek for answers to your questions through prayer, searching the scriptures, and studying the words of prophets, seers, and revelators. There are 15 on the earth today. You can trust them completely. Their only desire is to help you find joy in life and the pathway to your eternal home and happiness with your loved ones. Or else. Does that not you, scream we, or else to anyone? Yes, I did if, we have to lie to you to, if we have to lie to you to get you to eternal happiness, we'll do that too. Yeah, the problem is I, I did I did study their words and they weren't always honest. Um, that was the problem, and that's why 
I did all this. And and before we go to, I know it's going to be a bit of a long show tonight, but I hope it's been worth it. I would like to, if I may indulge myself, read you the final reply to Dan Lake Jokes and my state president. And I cc'd into this, my state president, the area presidency, area 70s, my bishop, the entire quorum of the 12 and first presidency. Partly because at one point I point out, well, hang on, guys, Dan Lake Jokes, by not addressing the other issues, is kind of throwing all of you under the bus. So you might want to, I thought if I can sow a bit of discord amongst the um, top leadership and get them to recontend with the issue, that might work too. Um, so I'm going to take a drink of water and settle in be, be, for a few before minutes. Before you say that, or do you want to take, are we want to do a couple of phone calls tonight too? I would like to, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my phone's going to go off here like crazy. Give me a second. So um, folks, the number is 662-667-6667 or 662-MORMONS. If you want to call in and talk to Nemo, ask him anything about this process. Uh, one side of this process seems to be transparent and ready to handle questions. Another side doesn't. So uh, by all means, give us a call. Okay, right. I'm going to need uh, questions or, uh, or comments off the screen just so I can make sure I can read the whole document. <clears throat> cool. Um, dear President Blank, thank you to you and Bishop Blank for your time meeting with me. Whilst at times tangential and circular, our conversation was nevertheless illuminating. I wish to candidly lay out my thoughts moving forward and hope you will receive them in the spirit of friendship and robust conversation we have shared so far. In response to my document, which outlined evidence of dishonesty amongst seven of the church's 15 top leaders, Dallin H. Oaks, one of the men shown to have lied multiple times in the document, told me that he had, quote, sent President Blank a lengthy letter suggesting how he talked to you about this subject, the aforementioned lying dishonesty, and giving reference to a public study that concluded I had not lied in my response at the University of Virginia. President Blank. Throughout this process, I have provided evidence and sources. Not only did you not bring the lengthy letter with you to our meeting, but you destroyed it. You kept referencing quotes or counsel that President Oak shared with you in this letter regarding prophetic fallibility, but you gave no actual quotes. If President Oaks felt the quotes he shared with you about fallibility were enough to overcome the weight of evidence I sent, if his counsel was meant to reassure me that the level of systemic dishonesty that my document showed was not of concern, then we really ought to be able to discuss these things accurately from the original source and not just from your recollections. I did not receive President Oakes's counsel. I received your limited recollection of it. I politely request that President Oakes send a second copy of the letter as the original has been destroyed so that we may actually discuss his counsel properly. Now to President Oakes's response, at least the part we still have access to. I provided a three and a half thousand word document to the office of the First Presidency as instructed by that same office, with evidence that seven of the 15 men currently called as prophets, seers and revelators have engaged in public dishonesty while acting in that office. Dan H. Oaks has not addressed any of that evidence. He has pointed to what he calls a public study, which was in fact undertaken by a church funded apologist institution, FAIR. In doing so, he is not making a statement of his own as to whether he lied or not. I find this odd that he cannot simply deny the wrongdoing himself and must rely on apologists to answer the question of his honesty. This fair public study, however, confirms that electroshock aversion therapy did in fact take place when President Oaks was president at BYU, which is what President Oaks was denying when he said, let me say about electroshock treatment at BYU, when I became president at BYU, that had been discontinued earlier and it never went on under my administration. The study states that there is no evidence that President Oaks would have known about the electroshock therapy, so he did not lie. However, my document contained evidence that he did know. So to send this study by way of a response to my document shows a limited reading at best of my document and its included evidence. When Bishop Blank very kindly contacted Elder Hales to ask, can you confirm that Brother Stilgo's complaints were duly considered? The response was to simply resend President Oaks' initial response to myself. I address the following to you, President Oaks. Do you personally maintain the position that you did not lie in your Q&A response at the University of Virginia, despite the evidence I provided that shows you were aware of the electroshock therapy? Irrespective of your answer, 
why did you choose to focus on this one issue within my document while the evidence of dishonesty amongst six of your fellow servants in Christ remains unaddressed? Evidence your office asked me to provide. Why have you relied on an external source of authority in the matters of your own words, actions, and honesty? Scott Gordon, as President of FAIR, is not a prophet, seer, or revelator, and he was not the one consulted in this matter. You were. When an appeal is made to, and granted for, prophetic insight, and all that is returned are the philosophies of men mingled with scripture, in the guise of an apologist article, it does nothing to assuage the worry that there is a pharisaical attitude taking hold within the highest levels of this church. After all, we have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Public dishonesty by someone acting in your position of authority is an abuse of the trust which the members place in you as a mouthpiece of God. It is also incongruent with President Nelson's teaching that prophets are rarely popular, but we will always teach the truth. Unless President Nelson was being fallible, unless he was speaking as a man when he said that. The letter you sent to President Blank, as far as he recalls, focused heavily on prophetic fallibility. Is this focus, along with your silence in regards to your apostolic brethren, to be taken to mean that apart from the University of Virginia incident, all other evidences of lying are not contested, and that this level of dishonesty I have described is acceptable under the caveat of prophetic fallibility. It is a strangely dichotomous situation to find oneself in, to be surrounded by men telling you to accept the fallibility of modern prophets, while those same men refuse to countenance the idea that prophets would be dishonest. If you want me to accept the idea of prophetic fallibility, that in turn necessitates an admittance of when you have been fallible. How else am I to accept it? And given that this month's enzyme teaches, when prophets are inspired to teach us, it is the same as if God were speaking to us, you can understand why I would be concerned to hear someone who, as though God himself is speaking, is saying dishonest and misleading things. The voice of God is not one of dishonesty. If this is the case, if the Lord's name is being taken in vain by men who claim to speak for him, but instead speak dishonestly, then we must consider DNC 107. Inasmuch as a president of the high priesthood shall transgress, he shall be had in remembrance before the common council of the church, who shall be assisted by twelve councillors of the high priesthood. And their decision upon his head shall be an end of the controversy concerning him. Thus none shall be exempted from the justice and laws of God, that all things may be done in order and in solemnity before him, according to truth and righteousness. The prophets and apostles cannot act as King Charles I and put themselves above the law by declaring, I am your king, because no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood. Your position in the priesthood as prophets and apostles does not justify dishonest behavior nor exempt you from church's standards of honesty as found in places such as Gospel Principles, chapter 31, Honesty. If you and your apostolic brethren are truly our fellow servants in Christ, then the standards to which you are held as members must all, the standards to which we are held as members must also apply to you. Because none are exempt from the justice and laws of God, not even you, President Oaks. And because neither you nor your apostolic brethren are exempted from the law of common consent, I have voted opposed to your continuation in your role, a vote I am invited to make multiple times a year in accordance with the law of common consent as found in scripture. Under that law and your instruction, I brought forward evidence of behaviours which are unbecoming of men called as apostles, and that evidence was ignored. If you are not willing to be accountable to the members of this church in blatant disregard of common consent and our democratic scriptural heritage, then please counsel me. What is the true purpose of common consent? I look forward to you addressing this soon, perhaps at, state, at general conference, as it seems the current enactment of common consent and its scriptural origins are at odds, and a clear explanation from a prophet, seer, and revelator speaking as though God himself was speaking ought to be able to clear things up, not just for me, but for the whole church membership. In sum, 1. Can I have a copy of the lengthy letter in its entirety? This owing to the fact the original was destroyed, and so I received a limited recollection of its contents. Two, do you personally maintain the position that you did not lie in your Q&A response at the University of Virginia, despite the evidence I provided that shows you are aware of the electroshock therapy? Three, 
Can I infer from your silence on the many other evidences of lying by your apostolic brethren that those are uncontested and that public dishonesty is somehow acceptable for those acting as prophets, seers, and revelators? Four, do you recognize that you are accountable to the members of the church as outlined in Doctrine and Covenants and the Law of Common Consent? Five, if you are not accountable to the members of the church, then what is the true purpose of the Law of Common Consent? Sincerely, Brother Douglas Stilgo. There you you go. are one one articulate British man. <laughs> you, that was that was a very well written, I think. And uh, again, I'll say it: I I am deeply jealous of the way you handled every step of this, um, because you you know you never lost your cool. You you follow the process the way it is. You hold them accountable to the rules they've set, and you've shown that this is entirely an illegitimate process that is. Uh, just one big circle, isn't it? Mm. One big circle. I still turn up. I still vote opposed. Nothing happens anymore. That yeah. that email was the last of it. Well, I think what you've done here, among other things, is show that this whole spiel in every general conference where if you voted opposed, please talk to your state president. All of that is a sham, a charade, mm -hmm. and meaningless. It's a farce. If, if you farce. win leadership roulette like I did, and if you play every single card right and you get your concerns and you and you write them out well and you evidence them and you fact them and you you put three and a half thousand words of evidence in front of a prophet, seer, and revelator, you play everything right, that's what you get back. And can I just add from a legal perspective that it's a basic axiom of the law that if one party, usually the plaintiff in a lawsuit, makes several allegations against the defendant, the defendant has to file a response or an answer. Mm -hmm. And generally, those answers are going to be, we're going to admit this, we'll deny this, we don't have enough information about this. Those are basically the three things you can say in response to the allegations. But if you do not deny an allegation, it is taken as admitted. And Elder Oaks, more than anybody else in the top 15, who sat on the Utah Supreme Court, and I think was a professor at the Chicago Law School, or maybe that's just where he attended, mm -hmm. he knows this. He knows this perfectly well. He's just counting on you not to know it. Yeah, and he counted wrong. <laughs> can I, hey, Nemo, can I play... Yep. Like something RFM often does when he comes on Mormon Stories, kind of plays devil advocate, try, sure. tries to be as fair as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of when I when I went to work on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. I was a legislative correspondent, and my job was to answer letters for the congressman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first I was like, oh, wait a minute, when we get those letters from our congressmen or from our senators or even from the president of the United States, that's not really from them written mm -hmm. by them, signed by them. And of course, it just took a 10 seconds to realize, okay, wait a minute. In this congressman's case, he represents millions of people. And, and in Dallin H. Oaks's case, he represents, mm -hmm. or at least, you know, leads literally millions of people. There's literally no way that he could engage everyone who wanted to reach out to him. Yeah. And it's kind of unrealistic and unfair to expect, you know, detailed intricate um, mm -hmm. engagement, even though they, of course, say they care about each one of us and, and invite us to engage with them. Is it, is it, uh, is it holding them to an unfair standard to expect them to actually do it? <laughs> it would have been at, at the beginning, but when he said he would do it, when he said he would investigate, all of a sudden he set the standard. I haven't my hands. Okay. He is, he has offered himself up to engage with it. I had my, uh, I think it was either my bishop or my state president said, do you know how lucky you are to have just got a response from him and the, that how much he shows how much he cares? I said, I'm not buying it. I'm not going to be fobbed off with, oh, isn't it wonderful that he replied? Because he chose to. 
he chose to pick up my question out of all the apparently thousands that he's getting sent all the time. Either him or his secretary chose to engage. And once they chose to engage, then they are responsible for the quality of the response they provide. I mean, that's fair. The other the other just thing that comes to my mind, mm -hmm. I remember when Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer were, were dealing with the Department of Justice when I was at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And there's just this level of hubris that top leaders have in any major corporation where, the, you know, it's like the king has no clothes. They're just not used to people telling them their poop stinks. They're not used to people criticizing them or calling them out. And literally, when when I started reading your correspondences with Elder Oaks, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is probably the only time in his life anybody's ever treated him this way, and he probably literally doesn't know how to deal with it. Yeah, well, I'm I am I am honored to have provided him with that expansive <laughs> experience, and I'm glad I've expanded his worldview a little bit before he becomes the leader of a church of millions, and then is even more responsible for the things he says and the things that he's done in the past. W wouldn't you three right? agree? <clears throat> wouldn't you three agree that the unhealthiest systems in the world, the people at the top are completely exempt from any accountability to their behavior? Mm -hmm. And and hasn't isn't the effect of this process really when they're in charge of their own account, when, when they commit, when someone alleges that they've committed some uh, act unbecoming of a prophet seer and revelator and they're the ones who get to judge their own uh guiltiness or innocence and then they don't even address the questions mm -hmm. doesn't that show a deep disdain for accountability and the process shows itself to be illegitimate and broken yeah can i mention that doctrine and covenant section 107 which nemo quoted actually tries to give balance to that and specifically mm -hmm. states such that even the president of the church, the president of the high priest did it's the same thing is going to be accountable and we'll have a special uh, committee council of 12 high priests. I think it is mm -hmm. who will sit in judgment. They've changed that. This new yeah. process is completely foreign to the doctrine and covenants. They have once again, abrogated their own scriptures in order to keep themselves unaccountable to the membership. Mm -hmm. Also, just note that common council that he mentioned, that common council has only been used twice. It was used once for Joseph Smith, and the council that was selected were 12 uh, brethren who acted as high priest, but it wasn't the council of the 12 apostles. It wasn't the standing high council or the traveling high council. It was just 12 brethren chosen. And then Sidney Rigdon was tried after Joseph Smith died, and then Brigham Young essentially handpicked the 12 people, and they were the future 12 apostles, plus I think one or two other guys. And they essentially then convicted Sidney Rigdon of apostasy. So it can be done. It can. It can. It can. <laughs> yeah. But funnily enough, when you ask someone to essentially excommunicate themselves, they're not going to do it which is what asking the office of the first presidency to investigate members of the first presidency is no one's going to find themselves guilty. It takes a very, it takes a person of immense moral fortitude to find themselves guilty. So, uh, um, so a healthy process mm -hmm. has somebody else stand in who is objective. Yeah. And uh, as, as unbiased as possible and then deems the evidence based on its merit. Mm. like okay. a special counsel in Congress. Counsel. Yeah. And isn't this similar to what the church does with its auditing practices where they have an in-house person who audits it and then comes out, gets trotted out every six months to say, Hey, we did the audit. Everything's a okay. Next speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah we, we did everything right. Don't, don't look here. It's fine. In accordance with approved practices and policies, I think is what they say. Can we see those practices and policies? Are they listed anywhere? Can I? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It is. You know, I, I have two questions uh -huh. for you. Please. So question number one is, let's let's reverse back to before you ever really engaged on any of this. Mm -hmm. 18 months ago. And you envisioned going through this process. Mm -hmm. How did, you know, how did, how are you surprised at the response 
In other words, how did what type how is how was the response different than what you imagined before you ever engaged? This is difficult because some of this shows my naivety and some of it shows my um shows my trust in a system that's clearly broken, I guess. Uh, is that I thought, well, if they do reply, I'll get something. And, you know, it may not be, it, it definitely won't be an apology and it definitely won't be an admission of guilt, but I'll at least get a denial. I thought I would get a denial if I got a response at all. I thought I'd get, no, I wasn't lying because. And I was I was like, oh, that's brilliant because then I can, I can weigh that up. And if that is a reasonable response, then fine. But what I got was almost worse than nothing at all in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't expect to be either ignored or just referred to your stake president? That wasn't your expectation? No, because I know I'm persistent enough to go past that. Especially once I found their email addresses online, I knew I could write an email that would... I wrote those emails specifically to... I, 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 so to certain apostles, I wrote nicey-nicey emails. So to Gong and to Uckdorf, I wrote quite nice um, gentle emails. To the Nelsons and the Oaks of this world, I wrote quite combative emails, knowing that I would probably get a fired up response, if nothing at all. They'd want to say something because, oh, their honor's been questioned, or, oh, this young man's misguided. He needs putting straight. Um, and sure enough, it, it worked. Do you expect to be disciplined? For pushing this hard, and you know, now you've come on a you know Mormon story. I'm untouchable, and, uh, Bill. Mormonism live. I'm untouchable. Well, well, but, but, well, in a sort, you are. Let me ask this: If the church were to excommunicate Douglas Stilgo, yeah, or the man known as RFM, and yeah. Douglas and, and and Nemo and Radio Free Mormon didn't say a word about it, mm -hmm. and the church has promised to keep those proceedings confidential. Would anybody know those two were excommunicated at all? Hmm. Hmm. If a Nemo falls in the forest. And, no, and nobody <laughs> hears it. <laughs> all right. We do have some phone calls. So yeah, I'm, please, I want you guys please. to definitely ask yeah. what you want. But if you're ready, I can go to them. I was just, okay. I'll, I'll keep my question till the Please. Till no, no. The... No, no. Go ahead and ask, John. Okay. Yeah. So Nemo, I can imagine you going into this thinking, they're not going to take me seriously. I'm just going to do this to be a burr in their saddle. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in them. I don't think they're really prophets, seers, and revelators. I know they're bureaucrats. I know they're a gerontology, and I'm mm -hmm. just going to embarrass them and have low expectations. That's kind of one, one side of, of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, and so and so they're basically behaving in a, in a way you expected, and you knew it all along, and it's just kind of a fun game for you. There's a whole other side of the spectrum, which is like, there's a part of you that really hoped that they would take you seriously and mm -hmm. engage you and show you the respect, um, you know, that, that, you know, show you respect and love and courtesy mm -hmm. and take you seriously. And so you're, you're actually sad right now, mm -hmm. sad, and disappointed at how they engaged you. Where are you on that spectrum? I'm I'm about dead in the middle. Parts of it were I'm just going to push this and see what happens. Particularly once they started replying, I was like, I can, I'm going to see how far this goes. I'm going to see if I can uncover something that's useful. But then instantly, that's what takes me to the other side of the spectrum, which is the sincere hope and the sincere belief that something good could come out of it. Because I think if I can get them to actually, if I if I can lead them along the path to actually making some progress. That would be good. And that's why that flowchart I shared is so important. Because what I have done in this is I've shown that you you can't, you have every right now to go beyond your state president. You, they, the first presidency, officer of first presidency, Brooke P. Hales is going to be in some trouble because they are going to regret the inundation. Everyone with a bishop who is somewhat sympathetic or a state president someone sympathetic should have their concerns now escalated up to the office of first presidency and so if nothing else that was amazing that that was a moment to me and i thought right we can make something of this yeah i think you position things so it's more than just getting a sympathetic bishop now with those emails 
-hmm. It's any bishop who is intent on doing what his superiors have directed. Mm -hmm. It's just how, how do they we make sure do those it. bishops know. Right. And how are we going to make sure that they know? Everyone's Where are gonna... all your documents accessible? Uh, I haven't made them accessible just yet, but they will be on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to do kind of an overview video, kind of like I did here, but it's all just going to be condensed. It's just going to roll through the document. Um, uh, I don't think there's anything libelous in my document that I sent to the Office of First Presidency, but I might let you have a read over that RFM just to, to, to get your opinion um, before I then publish that and try and get it to outperform, I don't know, one of the General Authority's latest autobiographies on Amazon or something. I'll see if I can get it higher on the bestseller list than well, their book. <laughs> well, as they say, truth is a defense. Yeah. So... You know, it, th this stuff will be will be available, but it's all obviously up on screen in this video. So really the way to get out there in the moment is for people to share this. It's all going to go online. I, we can we can make it accessible however we think is best. So, defer to you gentlemen for some help with that. All right. Well, we want to make sure that this information and documentation gets out mm -hmm. as far and as wide as possible for any yeah. of those who might want to follow suit. This side mm -hmm. won't be destroying any documents. Yes. <laughs> no, we save them. We preserve them. Yeah. Put them Anthony right up on Campbell, the why do I try and stay in so I can do stuff like this? You can't do stuff like this if you don't have a membership record number. You can't do stuff like this if you don't go to church on a Sunday. You can't try and make it a better place from the inside, even if that is a foolish and vain thing to try. Well, you're certainly ruffling some feathers at a minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just love the thought of every single one of the top 15 reading your email and the document that you attached yeah. and the discussions that took place in order to have Elder Oaks be tagged as the guy who's going to respond to you. Well, mm. let's get the lawyer. We'll have him <laughs> respond. Yeah. I think that's why they tagged him in. Yeah. The only person in the first presidency who should have been responding who didn't have a conflict of in interest was President Eyring. Mm -hmm. But I understand he was crying too much to write. <laughs> it really got to him. Oh, Always it does. Did. Can you imagine how happy he was to be the only member of the first presidency not accused of lying? Well, yeah. But then he, he doesn't get away with it entirely because he's the one that taught that it is a sin to think of church leaders having human weakness. So he it's his fundamentalist rhetoric that caused this document to be written in some ways. Right. Well, he doesn't say so, they don't have human weaknesses. He just says it's a sin to think about it. Mm. Very true. Do we have any calls? Yes. Do you have some calls? Yep, we do. So let or, me get the sound up and running. Me. No, no, no. So uh, Laura is going to be our first caller. Laura, you're on Mormon Stories and Mormonism Live tonight. Uh, you've got Nemo and the... And Hello again, Bill oh. Real and RFM and Nemo. You? Hi. How's, how's life treating you? Great. Oh, I'm so, I'm so excited to hear the rest of this story. Um, I've had some uh, opportunities to collaborate with Nemo, and so I heard a little bit about the beginnings of this story, and I've just been looking forward to, to hearing how it all plays out. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you great. I can't tell if anyone is responding. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for, for organizing this. And I've loved hearing um, John's comments too. They've been really valuable. I think this really answers a key question in the hearts of a lot of members, including myself while I was in like the throes of transition, which is like, do the general authorities know? Do they know that so many people are in distress? Do they, do they know that this looks inconsistent? Do they know about the problems in church history? And like, I know that the, the church history problems is like a little bit separate from the issue of them lying, but this at least addresses like a, a core aspect of that, which is that like, yeah, they know, they know that they're lying. They know that they're misleading the members and they're not willing to deal with it. Uh, and I think that um, the, the part about Scott Gordon is just still blowing my mind because this means that the incumbent prophet <laughs> is deferring Gordon, <laughs> doctrinal purveyor of, of, of like the revelatory engine of the church. And I think it was um, um, Peter Weekly who pointed out that, that Patrick Mason on a Morning Stories episode, sorry, long uh, citation, 
But um, printed out that Patrick Mason postulated that the apologists were the, the, the doctrinal powerhouse of the church and that the 215 are just the show pony administrators of the church. <laughs> just like the superficial front. Um, and I like the, this shows that like they think that way. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I can't believe they put it in plain text like that. This is, uh, this is huge. This is huge. So thank you yeah. for coming on. And um, sorry, I don't have like more pointed questions, but I really appreciated all of your commentary and uh, God bless. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So our next call looks like it's going to be, I think, Becky. Becky, you are on Mormon Stories and Mormonism Live uh, with the four of us, uh, especially here, Nemo. Um, what do you have for us? Is that me? That's you. Is the name Becky? Hello? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're goodness. On the air. Oh, I love, I love Nemo. I love John DeLynn. I love RFM. And I love Bill Real. But thank you. Uh, Maven. I do too. We have to we have to we have to get some women who have a team who do this same thing. Women Amen. only, like Margie Delin, uh Nuance Hope, Sandra Tanner, Lindsay Parker, L- Lindsay Hansen Park. There are so many. And you, Maven. We need to do something that is is just, you know, I love that the men are showing up like this. But until the women show up, the women need to show up as a group on a podcast presentation or a YouTube presentation. Yeah. They need to come together and show up. Love you, Maven. And love all you guys. Thank you. Okay, have a great day. Nice. Thank you. All right. Thank next you. Caller. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got a Jay Larson. Hello. Oh, here's Maven. Hey. Oh, Maven's Can I jump in? I kept my green screen again. Um, oh. I, I wanted to thank the, the last caller for that. Um, but I guess... Uh, I just also want to say too, um, I mean, Nemo did this all on his own and I I don't know. I just, I guess I just have some, some kind of mixed feelings um, at the idea of maybe just discounting these men just because they're men. I I mean, we all know that coming from Mormonism, there's a lot of patriarchy and men's voices, you know, already are out there. I, I honestly feel like in everything that I have done with Bill and RFM, and John, I've worked, you know, with these three most personally, not as much with Nemo, um, but they've always done as much as, as they can as from what I've seen to try to include women's voices. And I just want to say that I really appreciate that. And I know that I'm, I'm behind the scenes. And so there's maybe kind of some iffy feelings about that, that it's a little bit kind of relief society in the kitchen. But um, I, I've said this before, and I do just want to reiterate, I really do like my job behind the scenes um and at the end of the day like bill and rfm started this show this is their show and we have a lot of great female content creators that are out there we've got 21st century sage jane and alana who have been on tonight um margie is helping out with john delin um a lot more now and of course she's got the thrive stories and lizzie hansen park i there's just so many out there we've got expo legs we've got nuance hill and so i we all support these women i just yeah i just wanted to say that i i don't know that it's i don't know i appreciate the sentiment i really do i just don't know if it's fair it it's not these guys' fault that they're male and um and what they've done here tonight is really really amazing so i just wanted those are my two cents or maybe 10 cents thank you cheers maven and and i don't i don't I don't want to. I don't want anyone think I did this on my own because I had the support of, you know, um, I've had the support of this entire community. The Brit Vengers, particularly, um, we have a, a group chat where you know I've been known to send these emails and be like, guys, I'm not sure about the tone of this, or I'm not sure about this or that. Like, I, I don't ever want anyone to think that I just 
all these things came from my mind and that was it and and they just i just wrote them down in one go and sent them off you know i i worked and reworked them and got help and you know um I, it wasn't a one-man mission by any means so thanks to the brit ventures for all their support perfect yeah. all right so jay larson are you there Yes, I'm here. Okay, you hey, hear me? Yeah, you are on Mormon Stories and Mormonism Live tonight talking with Nemo. Well, I wanted to push back a little bit on, with John Berlin uh, when he said uh, Alan Oaks probably is not used to being resisted. I would I would invite RFN. I, you know, I've never been to law school, but I would think that somebody that's been through law school has had to put up with some resistance just like a football player has to get beat up on the football field a little bit um so go ahead rfm if you have anything to add to that <laughs> thanks oh sure oh thanks so much for calling jay larson i do think that um that's certainly the case uh, when you're a lawyer you know you have good days and your bad days there are days when you think you're the best lawyer in the world because you just won and there's days when you think you're the worst lawyer in the world because you just got to hand it to you but I will say that I think, if I'm recalling correctly, Elder Oak's career in law was abbreviated severely. And then he became uh, president of BYU. Then he became an apostle. And he's been that obviously long enough to be next in line to succeed, I think, a 98-year-old president. So he's been an apostle for about 40 years now. And it is my impression that when you become an apostle, i.e. top-tier church leadership, and you're surrounded by a bunch of yes men and now a few yes women, but no, no men and no, no women. You're in a bubble and everything you do is gold and everything you, um, well, like uh, I think it was, uh, I'm trying not to be rude here, but uh, you don't stink. Your socks don't stink. Let's put it that way. Okay. Nobody's going to say anything negative to you. Everybody's going to treat you respectfully. Your ideas are the best. And everybody who might have a different opinion from yours is just wrong, flat out wrong. So that's what I think they live in. I think they live in this bubble. And so I think it is a surprise to have someone continue to push and push and push with the direct kind of comments and allegations that Nemo made. And I honestly sense that President Oaks and anyone else who is engaged in this feel that they can fob off, like Nemo said, or put them away, distract them with these tactics that they use. Oh, here's a public study that says there's no evidence I lied. These are the things that when they come from an apostle, they are used to members listening and desisting and saying, if this comes from an apostle, it must satisfy me even if it doesn't. But that didn't work with Nemo. It didn't work again and again and again. And I think that they're very, very frustrated over this. And that's why they handled it the way they did, including directions, I am sure, to a state president to destroy the letter that was written by Elder Oaks in the first place. Those are, that's wanna, my take on it. If they want to come out and say that that's not what was written in the letter and show us a copy of the letter to prove that, that would be excellent. So I'm just inviting them to come ahead and do that if they'd like. And if I can quickly respond to Jay Larson, mm. I, I, obviously he, he served in the Utah Supreme Court as a justice. He obviously had some sort of corporate law, law job between whatever clerkship he did and, and, and serving in the Utah Supreme Court. Um, I, I'm not saying he's never been criticized in his life in a, in a work setting or in another setting. What I'm saying is, you know, I, I have worked at church headquarters and I know how they're treated. And I can guarantee you no church employee has ever called him a liar to his face. Ever. And I'm pretty sure he's never corresponded with the church member who's who's done that like Nemo has. That's the point I was trying to make. He cannot, there's no way he's in any way accustomed to this level of accusations and um, interrogation that, that Nemo subjected him to, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, once you make it into the top 15, everybody underneath you is tripping over each other to kiss your ass. I mean, that's that's the reality of it. Because mm. they all yeah, want to be the top 15, not to be the top 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry. L. Whitney Clayton. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Can I just say something here too? Nemo, if in the unlikely event that there is church discipline imposed upon you as a result of this and of this podcast, I just want to say at the outset that that will manifest without any question the absolute moral bankruptcy of the leadership of the LDS church. Yeah. And it will be the end of, of, of several people I know's testimonies because there are active believing members who have been watching this journey of mine and they're already not impressed. They're already not impressed by the moral bankruptcy that Dan H. Oaks has shown so far, by the lack of integrity he's shown by not being willing to to face up to me. How old is Dan H. Oaks? He's in his 80s. I am a 25-year-old young man. I am someone over which he has ecclesiastical responsibility and he has failed. And he's and and then after that, he's failed to just look me in the face like a man and just own up to what I've called him out on. Yeah. He's 90. By the way, he's, he's just 90. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He doesn't and... look a day over 89. <laughs> yeah. So. All I, right, I, boys. Yeah. I got nothing. Yeah, do you want I mean... to, do you want to be excommunicated Nemo? No, of course I don't. Of course I don't, but like what, what I, I, I don't see any other way it's going to go. Do you want to stay um, in under their terms? Well, I stay in the well, it's not been offered to me like that, so we'll we'll see. It won't if be they either, say, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, if they say you can stay in, but only if you stop talking, stop this, stop that. I'm like, well, I'm not going to yeah. stop. Of course, I'm not going to stop. Yeah. So the answer is no. The answer is no. Yeah. yeah. That's what integrity looks like. Hmm. I just any other phone calls, Bill? Yeah. No, no, we're good. I I actually ended it. Uh, uh, I think we took four or whatever. So, okay. So Nemo, do you want to give a closing statement here before we yeah. sign off? Yeah. So um, we're going to be disseminating this over the next uh, week or so. We're going to try and get this to as many people as possible because I think it's very important. Uh, and you know, follow my channel for updates on that. Follow Mormon Stories to get the this video and 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 whatever again. Uh, share this video with believing members you know because. If there's any video you want a believing member of the church to see, it's this. Because I am I am one of them. I am a member of this church. I go to church. I go on a Sunday. I attend. Um, I did all this through my bishop. I did it all through my state president. They were all complicit in it every step of the way. And that's what happens. So this needs to be seen by members of the church who think, oh, you know, if only... Because I've answered that question. I've taken common consent to its furthest possible logical conclusion and the church has been found wanting. Mm. Anything else from you guys? No, Nemo, I think that's awesome. doesn't all. Nemo, you're a, special, you're a special talent and a special voice in this community. Mm -hmm. I'm honored to work with you and I'm honored as someone who's been around a while, like I'm honored to see your creativity and your eloquence and your intellect um in this space it's Amen. it's inspiring to this old <laughs> old cat mm. yeah second time but i've still got a ways to go to measure up to rfm he's saying nothing <laughs> yes well it almost makes me it almost makes me sorry we fought that revolutionary war oh, man. <laughs> all right uh, if nothing else, guys, we'll uh, we'll close it out. You can uh, check this out again on uh, on Mormonism uh, discussion Mormon discussions YouTube channel. John, you'll be playing this again on Friday in Mormon Stories. That's the plan. And yeah. uh, and then I'm I'm expecting to see the Brit Vengers lay this thing out with some documents released here in the next few days as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, you guys have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nemo. Thank you, John. Thanks, Kevin. Make it easy. Great job, Nemo. Nice.